for this podcast. We're proud to partner with Zurich Life and Investments. As one of the last true independent life insurers, Zurich has always believed in the value of advice and the professionals who provide it. They continue to invest in programs such as this one that are designed to strengthen the health and reputation of the advice profession. They're excited about the chance to partner with us, XY Advisor, to help shape the future direction of advice and help make it more accessible to more Australians. To find out more or to check out some of the latest advisor support tools, visit the website or ask your Zurich BDM. We all know education is one of the biggest things in the industry at the moment. It's why we've created the XY Advisor platform. It allows advisors to do short four-week courses. And what we're really keen to do is to get as many awesome content providers in there. So if you're an advisor or a service provider who have put together an awesome solution which can affect change in the way an advisor does their job on a Monday morning, please do put together an application for us at www.xyadvisor.com. G'day, g'day. How's it going? What do you know? Strike light. Michael Houlihan, thank you for joining us on the Pleasure. XY Podcast. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, mate. Um, so uh, you're an uh, you know a, a, a VFL AFL enthusiast. Yes. Um, Tragic. And 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 you were telling me earlier today that you played twice. Was it last weekend? The over forty fives and the f- over uh, the over fifties. Correct. Yeah. Um, now, if I uh, have a picnic in the sun with my fiance and I'm thirty five, I get covered in bruises. How how do you manage to do something like that? My wife calls it stupidity. <laughs> um, I, I call it a, a passion for the game. I've, I'm an AFL tragic. I've played since I was nine years old. Yeah. Um, went went through amateur football till I was about twenty six. Yeah. Then had a twenty three year break. Yeah. Um, how come? Uh, well, marriage, kids. Yeah. Okay. And in the, in that twenty three years, it was interesting that two girls, two lovely girls, one twenty two, who's um, propping up the European economy right now on my money. <laughs> um, <laughs> doing a part. Yeah. Yeah, doing a part. They're very good parts. <laughs> and an 11-year-old girl. So, so when, when when they were growing up, it was all ballet. So, you know, I spent you know, 15 years at ballet class and how, how, not, not how is it, How is your, your yeah, pirouette, mate? It's really good. <laughs> uh, and then, then after a period of time, I, I joined the, the board of my daughter's school and one of the guys there was playing footy. Um, what we call veterans football or super rules in, in Melbourne. So he said, why don't you come down, um, have a bit of a run? And I was miles overweight back then, mm. um, 30 kilos overweight. And, no way. Yeah. And um, went down for a run, fell in love with the game again, lost about 10 kilos in the first, I don't know, two, two or three months, um, had the first game and back in love with it. So And six years later, still playing. Wow. And so, when did they install the winery at the school? Is that was that before or after the, the football? <laughs> uh, actually, the winery. What was? Uh, no, that was well before. That was well before. Yeah. That's, that's, that's where the that's where the thirty yeah, yeah, exactly. And then yeah, quite a bit where the um, preseason training occurs as well. So, <laughs> oh, very nice. Um, and so, you live north eastern Melbourne, yep. right on the edge of suburbia. I think you mentioned on, on this lovely wine area. Uh, and and when you're not sort of enjoying, uh, you know, the views from your back porch, which I'm sure are fantastic, um, you you you're a part of a financial planning firm, yes, uh, and a superannuation administration company, yes. Uh, you're on the board of your daughter's uh, school, yep, and you're playing football, um, mate. What what else don't and, you do? And, and I'm, tre- I'm treasurer of the club to the lower. <laughs> yeah, of course um, you are. <laughs> <laughs> of course you are. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, director of a research firm as well. But anyway, um, no, I, I just love being involved. I've always been. I, I go back to when I was at school, um, which was a, an all boys all boy school dip back in uh, Melbourne, and I was always involved in something there, w- w- whether it was um, coordinating coordinating dinner dances or things like. Always involved. So as I've gone through life, I've just always been involved. You're showing your age there, mate, with those dinner dances. Yeah, Jeez, I know. I know. Come on. <laughs> I'm surprised you're, uh, you've got time to uh, be sitting here with us today with the you know the spotlight on Super, the Royal Commission. Yeah, yeah well, that's been interesting. I think, uh, I mean, we've, we've got both the, the Royal Commission going on. There's also the Productivity Commission report that's come up recently as well. <clears throat> so I, I think if you go out five years, the whole landscape of Super is going to be vastly different to what we see today, mm. vastly different. I mean, we're Productivity Commission is looking at having you know, best of breed, 10 best of breed funds, which have become the default funds for everyone. I'm not quite convinced that will actually go through, but it'll be something similar to mm. that. So you link that in with the Royal Commission, and obviously the Royal Commission is looking at um, misconduct, 
dishonesty in the superannuation system, and I just think you'll see a dramatic change to the system over the next five to ten years. I heard them say the other day that they, they suspect that possibly, maybe, perhaps, the superannuation funds may not have their members' best interests at heart. What, what are your thoughts on that? Interesting. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the market segments, so there's three market segments. There's, there's industry funds, there's retail funds, and self many super funds. All have their place. Um, all, all do a very good job. Uh, industry funds, uh, what, what's called profit for members or not-for-profit. And interesting, the Royal Commission, they've, they're probably going to come through that pretty clean. And it sort of makes a bit of sense. They're, they're well regulated. They are not-for-profit. Sure, there might be some, some related party issues in some funds, but they'll sort of skate through the way it is. Retail super is linked to, obviously, the banking environment. So if you look at the Royal Commission, everything that's coming out the last week is all linked still to the banking misconduct, things that are going on, advisory groups not paid, or sorry, being paid incorrectly, being paid for people that have passed away years ago, things like that. Then there's a the self-money super fund segment, which I, I think um, is a real important segment of the market because the one that is so closely linked to financial advisors. And if you look at outcomes, member outcomes, things like that, I think the advice part of super is the bit that's missing from the industry super fund segment. The self money super funds do really well. So. Yeah. Well, we're seeing more <laughs> more, uh, more of the industry funds that are, I think they've recognised that as well. You mm. see, um, you know, Australian Super, Sun Super, uh, where they're partnering with advisors and making it really easy for, for those guys to, to, to do that advice element. But I think, you know, with the, with the retail funds, they're... There's there's advice there, but I th- what I don't know what I see is it seems to me that the legacy products are they've not caught up with the times. Yeah. Like it's a very commercial marketplace these days for advisors when if they're helping people choose these retail funds, um, so the the costs are more competitive, the products are, are better. But then there's all this legacy stuff which is you know yeah. uh, significantly more expensive when you compare it to what's available today. But there's no I suppose um, directive or motivation for those companies to to move anybody, no. um, and then that's a you know uh, I suppose a, a less positive outcome for the and, and, and that's what's coming out of the Royal Commission. So if you look at the MLC in particular, it's majority of their legacy products where you had an embedded cost for advice where mm. members really had to opt out as opposed to opt in, and that's where you've got the the big conflict of interest and you've got. So you're talking about trailing commission. Yeah, trailer, or yeah. there's there's advice fees that are sometimes embedded in products as well. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> and that, that that's where the issues come out particularly with MLC is that there was these things being charged, which was a great revenue earner for MLC, and looked great on paper, but they weren't getting anything. The member wasn't getting anything for it. So it's the whole you know, fee for no service argument that's going on, and and unfortunately that sort of tarnished the whole retail industry. But if you look at and I think you're right. I think you look at the, the legacy products are where the issues are. The newer type products is where you do have advisors involved because mm. they are the ones that are connecting with the with the member and with the product um, for the advice section of it. Mm. But there seems that there's so much so much sort of this inertia and apathy out there from people that they just don't look like they're you know people are. Um, you know, I would say, and it, you know, more more than less are, are dissatisfied with their super, but they just feel like that there's nothing that they can do or don't understand it well enough to, to make any changes. So I think that's why the legacy things are yep. sticking around for so long is for not much of a reason, in my opinion, other than people just don't know what to do to, yeah, sh- to that, change that, it. That's so, a huge part of it. I think yeah. the, um, the, the, the lack of engagement in super is a big issue. Now, again, self money super fund segment, that is an engagement bit because you've got the advisor involved, that's, a, that's already engaged. But if you look at the rest of super, um, it is really low engagement. And every industry super fund is doing their their best. They've got expert people and panels on member engagement, employer engagement. It's very hard. When you've got a compulsory system where you join an employer and automatically you're thrown into a super fund, it's hard to engage that person. They don't need to be engaged. So the engagement normally comes on trigger events. So some change in their personal life, whether it be marriage, kids, divorce, buying a home, whatever else, that triggers the engagement process. Yeah. A lot of industry funds are trying to link into that, and they do a very good job, but it's still very hard. It's such a big pool of people. 
you was you you think like I'm the CEO of an industry super fund. You think you could engage everyone. Well, you just you just can't. It doesn't work that way. Yeah, with the open banking that's coming around, I think that's going to play a very interesting part. So, in the UK, uh, any as long as a client gives uh, another company permission, a third party, they can uh, dive into any bank accounts. <clears throat> and I think one thing that's probably coming for the the industry super funds and whatnot is. Uh, is this this access to uh, to people's bank accounts? So, so if that's what the industry super funds are trying to do, which is uh, target people on these key events, and you've got this banking where oh, there's nappies, oh, yeah. right, they've got a kid, oh, right, so we can trigger the the the, the life stage engagement piece, which. Yeah. Um, yeah, look, it's. It, I think this open banking is going to give a lot of companies a lot of insights on on their on their members. Yeah. It's going to be quite interesting. Yeah, look, I, I think the whole industry super fund sector has been quite slow to move in this this, this area in particular because again, it comes back to the compulsory nature. So if you're a, an Australian super, you know there's going to be X billions of dollars coming in per month in compulsory contributions. So for a long t- long time, you know, funds just sat on their hands. And said, well, we don't need to do anything. It's it's really you know we talk about disruptors in the industry and it's hard to disrupt a superannuation industry that's very highly regulated and governed, but you can disrupt the way you communicate and engage with members, and that's what's happening in the market now. So mm. people are coming into the market, they're they're engaging well, they've got better technology, better processes. Industry funds now are catching up what's going on there, which is a good thing. I mean, that's, yeah. uh, you're learning from your mistakes and you're learning from the expertise that are out there. There's so much money in superannuation. The only people that uh, can win is uh, is everyone, the Australians. Yep. The competition is is brilliant. Uh, the, the end result, the end winner will definitely be uh, Australians, yep. which, is, the which is great. Yep. And, the, and because there's so much money, it's not like any super fund uh, even needs to, uh, you know, maritime for example, maritime maritime super. So um, they don't they don't need to roll up or roll away just simply because there are other options out there. You know, I'm sure that the the wharfies and and those blokes love their maritime super. They yeah. don't want to go on anywhere. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, yeah. Well, you, you got to you got to consider where super started in that area it was it was the name industry. So it was mm-hmm. an industry that you joined. Australian super sort of changed that because it's so big, and that's not a problem. But yeah, there, there, there's connections to the education sector there's maritime there's you know uh, host plus for hospitality there's there's yeah. hester for health and community and i, I think they've got a place and i yeah. think i think their engagement with that particular cohort is actually very good yeah well, they're definitely not going anywhere i wouldn't suspect no yeah no, no. nothing so you talk about like the the you know the the um changes that are happening in the industry and thinking and things that uh will will look very different in the future what do you think what do you think are the main things that you, you imagine will change over the next five years or so i think that there'll be a depending upon how far the productivity commission report goes and their recommendations, I think you'll see an acceleration of the merger activity in that part of the market. I mean, there's not that many funds left now, but if you follow the logic of what the Productivity Commission are doing, so best in breed, again, I don't think it'll be exactly that, but it'll be something similar, you'll need to be a very large fund to compete with that. So the the, the, the idea of the Commission and best in breed is not just based upon performance. There's all sorts of other attributes that go into it, and there's an independent panel that selects those, those funds. But I think you, you need to be probably, I'm guessing in, say, five years' time, you'd need to be $25 billion up to be actually to compete in those sorts of markets for the default market. So, yeah. again, remember, this is the default oh, yeah. market. I see. Um, <clears throat> I've had lots of discussions the last few months about this, and you know, if you put your retrospective hat on, which is very easy to do, when, when my super came in a few years ago, what they should have done... Um, which is controversial. What they should have done was set up one default fund. Ooh. Oh, one see. default fund because you communist. I am. <laughs> in a way. In a way. <laughs> so, so the logic behind that is that the whole idea of, with my super concept was for people that are defaulted into the system that have actually got no choice at all. They're defaulted in through EBAs or union arrangements. They're defaulted in an arrangement that that is um, lower fee arrangement, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Why have competition in that space? Oh, geez, that's a philosophical so, question. It is, it is. Mate, we, we could spend all the money on our infrastructure and give everyone a deemed 7% interest rate. <laughs> <laughs> we could do that as well. <laughs> but like, I just think, yeah, it is, yeah, it's a retrospective hat on. 
then the arrangement is, okay, if someone opts out of that system, then you opt into an environment that's where you've got competition. Because that because that's where you're trying to attract people with certain cohorts or yeah I, I like do that. like the concept of it. it it's you know the lazy money stays in in the safest possible environment mm. and then if someone is engaged in any manner then they can opt into another option yep. I think you're making way too much sense here mate sorry <laughs> this is the superannuation <laughs> industry Jesus Christ we have to but where's the profit margin yeah. and who gets it. <laughs> Uh, it's interesting. Um, I'm looking at some of the the findings that are coming out of the latest round of the RC, and um, interestingly, and this this really blew me away. It's always interesting to see what uh, these QCs and, and and people that are that are looking at the superannuation industry and the financial advice industry from a third party point of view outwards looking in. And a big trend in financial advice and in products these days, and I think Ben, you're a pretty big fan of this, is moving to that passive. Uh, investment, mm. uh, yeah, it's quite big. Yep. In, in fact, um, I believe one when you look at net inflows and outflows, that a hundred percent, I believe I, I read heard this a couple of times, of new money has gone into passive over the, since the GFC. That after you take yep. in consideration the outflows of the and the inflows with the active stuff, it's basically all the new flows have gone in to, to passive. That's how popular it is. However, these QCs have turned around and said, well. You're doing nothing for your money then, the advisor. And, uh, and it literally, it, it, it then went in to say, look, if you'd chosen Ben along or if you'd chosen, you know. If. If, yeah, if you'd chosen these active, uh, <clears throat> active managers, then okay, you can, you're allowed to charge a fee. But not if you're just giving the index. And I was like, wow, that is like the complete, the complete opposite of where, um, because even the advice to go into passive is, is, is certainly worth something. Absolutely. Yeah, but I think if you're charging if you're charging a percentage fee on on a passive investment strategy, I don't think that's sustainable. Like, yeah, because why? But but, but, but don't forget because the, the, because you've given uh, now oh, because I, oh yeah money. Yeah, but but the, the invest, investment piece <laughs> no. of advice is only a very small piece. Agreed. Yes. Very small yes. piece. Yeah. As we all know. I'm like uh, very close to 100% passive with the, with the the only deviation of that is is pretty much ethical um, in, you know, most most of the time. And spread but out. I don't, what? <laughs> maybe employer super <laughs> offer, financial yeah. wellness, what? Um, but, yeah, like I've ch- I, I transition all my clients away from, I was charging a fun fee up until, well, I suppose it was July or so last year. And it just didn't make sense. Like for mm. for, for me, I, and I looked at it, and I went into all of the what we do for for an investment management. And like my business is different in that I do f- a high touch coaching and yep. um, all personal strategy. So I'm I'm spending a lot of time with my clients all the time anyway. But I felt that it wasn't, you know, for someone with fifty thousand or a hundred thousand, there wasn't five hundred dollars worth of extra time that went in mm. for my part, or or not even, you know. 300 and a profit margin. What or, about the risk argument? You're taking on more risk. Yeah, oh, yeah, I think that is uh, that is an argument. I, I was actually just considering that. I, I'm talking to a client at the moment and he's got uh, a couple of mil, which is way, thank you, Atlassian, um, <laughs> way, way more than, you know, what I would normally deal with uh, mm. for, for individuals, at, definitely in, in, in recent years. But, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I suppose there is probably a little bit more reporting a little bit more hand holding there so probably a higher fee definitely there's an argument 50 million to 50,000 there's a you have to charge more but i don't sure. know i still haven't really figured out where is yeah, the line okay. like what's the work if i've got 2 million in a vanguard fund he's probably going to ask me a few more questions but you know is yeah. it is it thousands and thousands of dollars of extra work probably not no no that's no. not yeah but the, the the passive argument's very interesting you look at and I will disclaim here, I did work for Vanguard for a number of years. So, But but you look at Vanguard's inflow and their, their thumb now, which is worldwide, which is twice the size of the Australian superannuation industry. So we're, we're $2.6 billion, a trillion dollars super. They're double that and probably a bit more. And In, in their thumb? Or their in their thumb, yeah. worldwide. Yeah. And, and, and that's big, big numbers. You look, Black, BlackRock's even bigger than that. They're, they're not just passive, but... Um, but you look at you know the Vanguard in Australia, for example. I'm not not quite sure what percentage. I'm guessing ninety something percent would be all superannuation money. In yeah. Australia. And yeah. and in fact, what what triggered a lot of the inflows lately has been the introduction of ETFs. Obviously, because they're, from an advisory point of view, I put my advisor hat on. I'd much rather deal 
on a direct basis than through a managed fund basis. Yes. Um, it's just so much easier to do. So I think I think accessibility does, does work very well for, for companies like Vanguard. But I think also that, that you know, again, I, I go back to the advisory hat on, we've employed a, a core satellite approach to investing for years. So the core is the index because you, you know what you're going to get and then you add spice to that with the satellite investments around that. And that concept to us has worked exceptionally well. Now, uh, I won't ask for a product recommendation, but what are some themes, some thematic suggestions for your uh, satellites? Well, I'll get the, 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 the advantage of the satellites is, is um, time dependent. So, mm, okay. so, so you're, 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 you're quite active. Yep. Yeah, okay, cool. Yep. So, so it might be not quite now, but a few years ago was... You know, healthcare sector, for example, and you can right. buy ETFs in that area of Australia wide mm. and, and around the world, technology, things like that. So it's just a matter of knowing the market, getting the right um, research and advice. The, the core doesn't change because the core is the main part of the portfolio. It's the satellites that change. And, and, how, and sorry, sorry. So being a smaller part of the portfolio, you're not adding a lot of risk or cost by changing the satellites. Sure. And, and how did you approach doing the, you said, research around the funds? What was the process for choosing the, what you would use as your satellite? Mm. Well, we, we have our own investment committee. <clears throat> we, we filter in research from all over the place. You know, we, we, we spend a lot of time talking to, to, to investment managers, research houses, whatever else, form an opinion. Uh, we have another independent body person on our investment committee, form an opinion, and then um, implement that through our portfolios. So how do you find out about the next uh, Netflix or Afterpay? Well, we're, we're not trying to find the individual. Mm, okay. It's, it's themes. Ben, ben actually jumped onto Afterpay at what price, mate? $1.42. What's it now? Fourteen fifty or Ooh. something today. Wow. 10X. I'm in trouble for my super fund because uh, – I'm not supposed to have any individual holding above 25% of my of my fund, and let me tell you, I'm way above that. <laughs> they keep saying to me, let us sell. You need to sell. You need to sell. And, and you're like, like, I don't oh, want to sell. Nah. <laughs> if I would have sold when they told me to sell the first time, I'd be $80,000 worse off. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. They've done a Good remarkable job because they, they launched in the US, didn't they? And then a competitor in the US almost beat them to it, but then they've established themselves or, or something to that extent. They launched in the US and they did they did the growth in one month that they did in 18 months in Australia. It took them 18 months to get to a certain turnover size. Yes. Went to the US and did it in a month. Now, wow. I just I can't figure it out why people use it. So, I don't know. My wife uses it. My and, broker, I've got a, bro- a mate that's a broker and I needed a broker to to run that, that part of my, my fun. Um, and he, his wife used it and he's like, he's loaded. Um, <laughs> and, and he's like, I don't know why she's using it. I say the same thing to Yang and like, just pay for it with the money. Like the money is there, yeah. but I don't know. It's like this weird yeah. psych- psychology. I thing. just don't get it how it's different to a credit card. I really, really don't. It's credit, but it's not on the card. That's, yeah, but that's... you can link it to a debit card, which is weird. I don't understand yeah. it, but I'll, ha- I'll take my 10x. I don't need oh, cost. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, they've done a remarkably good job, whatever they're doing. Tapped into something I'm not, I have nothing. Absolutely. So do you think that that consolidation of funds, is, do, you th- do you see that as being the major change coming out of the, 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 you know, the inquiries that they're making at the moment? I think that's the major change out of the Productivity Commission report. Yeah. Um, Interesting that the, the Royal Commission, and if you look forward a few years anyway on the advisory side, and what's, what's happening there is that we've got the new education standards coming in. Um, they're still being debated, but I think they're reasonably well set with, with FASIA and what they're going to do. So if you think about what's going to happen there is that you've got a lot of advisors that have been in the industry for a lot of years that don't meet those educational requirements or don't want to go through the new requirements will drop out of the system. So they're, they're, they're suggesting anywhere between 15 to 25% of advisors will drop out of the system over the next five years. Now, th- th- there's good and bad with that. Th- th- the good bit is you're, you're probably getting rid of the ones you, you want to get rid of. The bad side is there's some really good advisors out there that, that don't meet the education standards that you're going to lose out of the system. And I think that's a real pity with that. Yeah. So. If, I think if Peter Johnson yeah. from the AOIP gets his way, uh, they'll all be fine. It's just uh, if you've got an X amount of experience, you should just let him through, apparently. I think he's lobbying for that. Yeah, he's lobbying well. for that, yeah. <laughs> don't totally agree with that, but anyway, that's... I'm not sure that he'll uh, get it over the line. Yeah. I saw that uh, I saw the AFA put out something recently about the FASIA and they've been talking to Kelly O'Dwyer about 
trying to get an extension for this exam, which is supposed to be, yeah. it was like next year, early 20, next 20, year. 2019, yeah. yeah. Or something, which uh, they haven't put out the guidelines for. 65% pass rate or something. No one knows what the curriculum is. <laughs> yeah, and it's a, a closed book exam. But, well, I mean, what, what that's doing is setting a benchmark. That's the whole idea of that exam. Yeah. So the benchmark's the whole industry, and then after that you've got your educational requirements. So, yeah. I, I, I agree with what they're doing. I, I don't think the implementation's right. Well, I think that sort of mm. timeline, though, is a bit rough. You look at people and people have got families and businesses and, mm. you know, everyone's busy these days. It's like, give us a, if you want us to study, like, give us some time to, to study. I don't know. Yeah, XY, we're trying our best to get involved in this in a way that people it makes it easy for advisors but we're not we don't want to be the ones that come up with the content so we've been slowly yeah. shaping our website to be the holder of educational content and i, I, I will wonder who, who do you think will be producing the, the the this test is it kaplan or is it a university or is it the fpa or is it the afa and who's like? Do, do we know even to that extent on I who's producing? Don't this think we test? know that yet. I, I, I know that obviously Fazzy are dealing with it, but I yes. don't think the concept of who's going to actually do it. No. You're right. No. Okay. I think they said it was mainly ethics. That was what I was reading in the AFA. AFA sent a love note around uh, pro- predominantly ethics related questions. Now, I I did mm. I did the, F, the FPA one. Uh, ethics. Oh thing. man, I did that as well. Whoa. No, no, it changed that my life. Intense. I loved it. I loved it. I learned so much. <laughs> truly, truly. Yeah, because I, I had no idea that ethics was different for people, right? So in that course, it's it, you learn all about utilitarianism and deontology, right? So the fact that I can just roll those well, words off right my on. tongue now means I've spoken about it so much because it throws me... like So deontology is you do something right because it's the right thing to do and that is one ethical framework and a lot of people have that and then other people have the ethical framework of utilitarianism which is what's the best outcome for the most amount of people and depending on what your ethical framework is the the one that you belong in makes sense and then the other one you're like oh well that's not necessarily bad but then if you think about it and you go a bit deeper they do actually clash like if you do something for the right because it's the right thing to do but it, it might cost uh, it might cost damage to the to the majority of people. Then you've got this big clash, and that is one of the things that I learned from FPA one. There we go. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> There's a lot of words, man. Six thousand words <laughs> or something on ethics. I was just like, oh man, I'm ethical. All right, come on, give me a break, guys. But with eth- which ethical framework were you? <laughs> yeah, <I don't> <laughs> Uh, yeah. So tell us about the submission process because you you had to put some stuff together for the Royal Commission. We did too. Yes, we were issued with what's called notices to produce. Mm. Um, Sounds scary, man. Uh, it did sound scary at the time, <laughs> um, but for, for again, it was this particular Friday, and um, you know a lot of the industry super funds we speak to each other, and we all got issued with these notices on this particular Friday, and relatively short deadline to produce information. So the information they're after, nothing untoward was all of your board packs, so not not the board minutes, but all the supportive stuff for the board meetings, wow. um, all your committee meetings, went into things like, um, which sort of made a lot of sense, went into things like directors' remuneration structures, how that worked, um, related party uh, issues, contracts, remuneration, things like that. So it was, it was, it was a fair chunk of work that, that, that came out, and of course the, the deadlines were, were pretty short. And it, sorry, it included, you know, financial statements as well as that for, for going back. Um, I think it was about five years. With oh. so it was the interesting process because because you get you get the the phone call, you get the email, then you get subpoenaed. Yeah. Um, it, yeah, which is <clears throat> interesting process. Um, very short timeline, and then you've got to produce the the, the initial arrangement is to produce hard copies of everything. So you imagine that will like, you know, the, oh, the, the fund on the CEO of Combined Super, small fund. We probably had, I'm guessing, sixty thousand pages. Wow, the stuff. We didn't didn't do the hard copy process, and then it's either USB or there's a specific um, data arrangement that they they want. So we we issued that with that. So every they fund, didn't tell you to send it to that mm. um, that old nursing home with all the healthcare records. No, <laughs> no, didn't go there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so quite quite a daunting task, and obviously from that they then ascertained to the next dig deeper in certain areas. Now, we, we didn't get that the next next round. Obviously, funds did. Um, and then they're looking... The, the related part of the thing was one of the things they're looking at in particular. But obviously, if you look at the MLC uh, arrangement, what's going on there, 
they've dug very deep and very micro to get to certain issues with that. And I'm, I'm guessing with when you look at the um, industry funds that are up against up against them, that are presenting to the, the Commission, like Australian Super was yesterday, it was a few hours, I believe, nothing at all came out of that, off you go sort of thing. And I think you'll find most industry funds will be like that. So, that, so the, the area of the Commission, again, as I said earlier, is looking at linking back through the banking part of it and the same practices occurring in banking that are occurring in superannuation. So, And so do you think that the related party thing is uh, will cause any issues? No. For, no? Dealt with. Well, can, can we can we dive into what the related party is? is, is so this is this is for uh, industry super funds who are basically outsourcing to companies that the board members own, or is, is things that, like that, or, yeah. or, 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 or the unions, or, or the unions own, or the fund itself owns. So right. you look at you know, if you go so, back, so it's not for profit still. However, they're just all the profits are over there. Correct. That's so, right. And they're they're really deep diving into this specific topic. Yep. Yep. I'd be, it'd be yep. great to find out what goes on there. Yeah. Well, again, we've we'll, we'll, we'll got the rest of this week, and I think next week as well with the, the super parts. I think there'll be more that will come out. But again, if you look at industry or the whole superannuation segment, but industry super funds in particular, with your disclosure requirements, everything is actually disclosed. Mm. Well, yeah. they changed that. They changed it recently, didn't they? The, yeah. Yeah. All of the, the fees. That was the fee. Yeah, it was yeah. Like last, late well, last that, year, there was the RG97 fee yeah. disclosure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so did you, is subpoena, does that mean you have to go there? Is that, you'll excuse my ignorance. No, nah, subpoena is you get issued with a document, yeah. which, is a, which is a court document. Uh-huh. So, so the Royal Commission is a court. Oh, yeah. So, so. you didn't have to do the ghost. You know, no. And, and, no the, and, and subpoena, does that actually, or am I just confusing this with Hollywood, where you where someone has to it's hand a, it to you yes. in person? Yes. That's a real thing? It's a real thing. Did, did you try and run away? No. You didn't subpoena me. You didn't subpoena me. <laughs> Did they walk up and be like, Michael Hulan? And you were like, yes, you've been subpoenaed. Is that, no, well, is that well, actually, what, what happened was that because they, they came into the, the reception of the office yes, and they said, I'm here to issue a subpoena to, oh. to Michael Hulahan. Oh, my God. And, of course, the staff are gone, okay, well, what's, what's, what's he done now? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrifying. Yeah. Do they have to say something? Because it's like in America they say you've been served or something. Yeah. Yeah, it's something you've been served. You got you got to sign something to say you've accepted right. the or received the information. In a stri- was he wearing a wig or something? No. Oh, okay. No. No. All right. No. Oh wow. And so you're running a financial planning business as well. Uh, yes. Yeah, so well, part, a part owner of a financial planning business. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And do you see do you any impact from the from the RC on on the business? You see? Not. No. Not really. I mean, it's 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 probably more of a. I mean, we're we're. We like to pride ourselves on our, our compliance side of the business anyway, um, but it probably is just a heightened awareness of our disclosure requirements to, to clients with that. But no, we don't, we don't see an impact really. Anything from clients? You, you Nothing at all. Much conversation? <clears throat> Nothing at all. No, I think the, the, the impact's going to obviously be you know, the four banks and AMP mm. with that. So in any connection, any branding with those things from, a, from an advice point of view, I think is going to cause some issues through clients. Um, but being purely independent, which we are, own license, we've got no issue at all. Do you do you see the future as being less uh, less small independent or more small independent licensees? I actually see more small. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the the value of being with someone like AMP, mm. if you look at the you know the, the, the bowler arrangements which came out in the Royal Commission as well, so buyer last resort. There's an advantage of being with an AMP or a bank if they're going to provide that sort of yeah. buy or last resort. But if you take that out of the equation, I, I think there's more value proposition for your clients in being independent than being tied to an organisation. Whether, you, whether you're utilising the vertically in, integrated product suite or not, mm. I think post the commission that you're going to be tarnished with that anyway. So I think groups moving more to be independent, I think, is a, is a great value proposition. Do you do you see now ducking into that MLC issue for a moment? I uh, one someone that I know, poor man, actually, we've had him on the, uh, the the podcast a couple of times. He's involved in the Workplace Superannuation Association. He, he's he's on he's uh, a part of that um, board there. So he was saying how uh, the MLC situation. They they renamed commission to advisor service fee, yes. and then it became a major issue because there was you know no service. Yeah, and uh, and and they've cut it 
in the last week or so, right? Or, or, or yep. a month. Yep. And um, and that this has cost, you, you know, you, advisors all over Australia a, a lot, a lot of uh, revenue and, and sale value. Um, can this happen? Can, can the advisors group together and perform a class action against these large financial institutions, even in the event that they are simply doing what's what the law has uh, issued them to do. Because I've never come, a, I don't quite understand where the fault lies. So, for example, yeah. with, with taxi drivers, the fault has lied now with the passengers of Uber and, and, and Resh, uh, sh- uh, ride sharing apps. So we pay a dollar for every ride that you take in an Uber, and then that goes to uh, a pool of money which yeah. is getting paid out to the, the taxi guys for, for their licence plates because it's cost them so much value. Where Where is the fault going to – is it just simply fall at the feet of the advisor? I, I, I think you'll find, going back to the early point, I, I think there's more of the legacy product stuff. So I think you'll find that the <clears throat> commission advisor service, whatever, whatever it's called, is not actually going to the advisor. It's going to MLC. To the company. To the company. And if you look at, you know, I go back years and years in the, the funds management industry, that, that was a common thing. Right. Was that there would always be a fee in whatever form charged. And if the advisor was connected, the advisor, it would go to the advisor. If there's not, it would go to the, the company that company. hold it. Right. Yeah. I helped my uncle with uh, with his super and he had an old, old MLC fund that it must have been set up like maybe 1990 or something. So it was like one of the really, oh, really early the early funds ones, be- before yeah. you actually needed to have um, oh, okay. like, the voluntary a, a, yeah. a, a mm. super fund. Started doing the, the information collection uh, piece. The, f- the total fees on his fund were over 6%. Cool. Yeah, yeah right. And he goes, I don't know. He goes, my fund's been at two hundred grand for like for years. I don't know why it's not going up. I'm like, yeah, I know why. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's crazy. Those those really early products. Yeah, that's um. I I'm sure know. if you go back sp- far enough, the industry funds were probably similar. I would imagine if you go back to the late '80s and early '90s. The pro- only thing I could think was that inflation was so high then that they thought that maybe that was reasonable. To charge as a fee because the returns. Yeah, the interest been, rate at that point would have been eighteen percent in nineteen ninety. Yeah, so, right, and then he just never changed it. This is the inertia that we were talking about. Yeah. Oh, no. absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. That would have been the good. Yeah, I'm not convinced industry funds would have been caught up in that because it was it was never the structural right. arrangement. Right. Um, because again, you, you, you go back to you know these legacy products and things like that. They're, they're owned by an institution. Yes. Whereas no one actually owns an industry super fund. So it's, yeah, not, so it's not there to make profit. So I would doubt that would, that would be the case. And plus the industry funds, I'm just trying to think of an exception to that, but they all just have one line, like one product, right? It's like if the product gets, if the product improves, everyone gets the improvement. It's not yeah. It's not like yeah. there's this stream and that stream and this legacy. and Really? Legacy. Well, I don't know. How many classes of Australian super are there? I don't know how many products there or are. like first state super. How, how many different products for? does uh, your industry super well, fund? Well, the... I think products are a dangerous term in this because it's a superannuation fund with Good. investment options. Hmm. So c- collectively, that's the product, if you want to call it that way. Sure. So that's – yeah, so that's it. I, mean, I think I – think, was it Host Plus or one of the industry funds had set up managed investment schemes based upon their investment options yes. so that other super funds could use. Hmm. Right. But, when but there's it, no like, you know, you know um, like Host Plus – Pinnacle fund, which is offered from a certain date range, and then they replace no. it with another thing. No. It's not like ah, that's. that's no. I think that's the big difference between <clears throat> that, the industry guys and the, right. the retail because correct. they just go, "This is a product," and then they go, "Okay, we got a new product which is more yep. competitive." But then everybody there, right. you're just, okay. You're just, so you're an just industry super there. fund would just have one spin or USI number, yep. whereas a retail can have like a hundred. Oh, it'd be still still the one USI. So the U, U, USI is just a oh, identifier. Yes. So Come what, on, Clayton, don't what, you run a super fund or something. <laughs> <man? laughs> but what what one is industry funds have is investment options. Yes. So, so you join and you you join the conservative option. Mm. What happens underneath that is subject to the trustees changing the investment structure if they want to change it with that. But the investment option doesn't change. The trustees have been getting hammered in the RC. Yes. The trustees. The the trustees of retail funds, yes. Yeah. That was where they were talking about that sneaking suspicion that perhaps maybe possibly, potentially, they might not have been acting in the 
in the ultimately the best interests of the members. Yeah, that's uh, that's it's a big claim to to come out and say that. But it's hard for a business. It, like biz, like the retail funds are for profit. Yeah, enterprises, right? Like, yeah. clearly, the best thing, the very best thing for the members is to charge them cost, and then the members are the best off. Right? Yeah, sure. Yeah, but then it's like that's well, that's not good for the person providing the fund. Yeah, of course not. Well, and then they're paying. It's, the it's, trust al- it's, it's like, almost like it's this weird. Thing. Yeah, it is. It is weird. I mean, everyone likes to bash the banks. It's a bloody Australian pastime, right? But but at the same time, um, we can't. We, I mean, you can't demonize these entities for pulling a profit. Money. Yeah. yeah. I, like to make money. I mean it's I it's kind of someday. it's kind of I'm reading a lot of this stuff and it's oh shock horror the trustees were actually trying to make money. Make money. I'm like, oh yeah. come on. Yeah. I mean this I mean how far how far how far is the discrepancy between a, uh, one of these underperforming retail funds and the highest performing industry yeah. funds? Like, what what is that basis points difference? Fifty? Again, it, it, it's, it's hard. It's hard to compare. You oh, can't yeah. compare on performance. <clears throat> but, but, but you can compare you try the to, pair. But even you try to, what what part of the fund are you comparing? Mm. Because you know retail funds have you know three hundred different investment options mm. in there. Which one yeah. are you going to compare? That's why I don't understand. Very you get clients yeah. that look on these like these comparison sites on the internet, and they say, like, and and I looked at it because a client sent me something about well, it might have been one of the funds that we were using with clients, and they're like, this this compares poorly, and I'm like, well, yeah, <laughs> what are you comparing? What are you, what are you looking at? Are yeah. you looking at your I F compares poorly against my host plus? It's like, yeah. wait yeah. a second, yeah, the I F super fund, like, was yeah. the I F. Super fun cash option. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what yeah, is, what is it? Yeah. yeah. Interesting. When you look at industry funds, so you look at um, you know, research houses like you know, Super Ratings or Champ West, who put out performance tables monthly. If you look, um, and obviously in the industry super fund sector, the, the number of funds has shrunk over the last years significantly. So I can't think what number you're down to now. But but you look at the the normal distribution of returns. If you go out say five years, seven years, ten years, it's a real narrow. Normal yeah. distribution, which sort of makes sense because you're getting very large funds um, yeah. consolidating. You're investing in relatively the same assets and the same asset allocation relatively. So the, the differential is very small. Do, do you know the guys from Super Ratings? Yep. Do you take them out to the... The vineyard, the vineyards. The vineyard? No, yeah. no. <laughs> oh, look at this lovely, uh, we, red. twenty year old. My goodness, only for the most important people. Uh, uh, uh. Mate, you have to send me their uh, email later. <laughs> do, is that? Do you think though that that's a problem? Like we we're talking before about um, c- consumers and the the inertia and not knowing what to do and the confusion around that, and you've got these. Uh, these companies, these rating houses, and then they're, you know, uh, a, a big chunk of their business model is is advertising, and then and then and web traffic, and this. So they're pumping it to consumers to say, come onto this this side and check out these funds, and then they're they're making these comparisons that don't make sense, in particular for the the com- comparisons with the retail funds that where it's like, what are the three hundred options are you looking at? What's the fee structure? What's yeah. the product structure? Yeah. Like surely that's that's probably confusing people more rather than giving them the information that they're sort of purporting to mm. put out there, right? Yeah, yes, and no. I think if you look at the uh, the industry segment, so which is the, which is the the highest level of default people going in. It, it, it's I, I, I've never come across a member of a super fund that's gone on to super ratings or whatever else to compare super funds mm. because they're defaulted in. Yeah. yeah, but so they, they but they do but when they the when it, when they decide that they want to make a choice then they that's when they compare. Yeah, but the, the the comparison is normally the water cooler chat about my performance is better than yours. <laughs> yes. it really is that that that's how that occurs. And but and it's rare that they would go to any this this is this is people not seeking advice obviously. But it's rare they would actually go and seek anything further than that to say Michael's returns better than Clayton's so I'm the better one. Mm. And that's exactly what happens. It's as simple as that. Yeah. But mm. it's us yeah, I don't know. I think it's I think it's a major problem with finances generally, but with these products and, and in particular superannuation, which is such a huge uh thing for so many people that 
it's they're they're making decisions based on these sorts of things, which is clearly not the the, yeah. the best way to do that. Like I, I don't know. I think you know the the ASIC and Money Smart that website fantastic. Mm. Um, you know, could be could be better, could be more, but I, I don't know the the way to, to to educate people. But I think if people were more educated, they'd make better decisions. It's um, yeah, it's a shame that there's no resource out there that provides that. Correct. I, I think that, that there's a if you if you look at the way the industry's moved in switching super funds, it's really easy to do now. Um, yeah, you do it through good. super stream technology. Um, the requirement from either super fund is a three day turnaround. Problem with it, I see, and when and. We, we are seeing it come out to play, is that, that if I'm making my decision based on performance, I haven't thought about what insurance options I've got in my fund, mm. what I've got where I'm going to. Absolutely. And, and if I switch, I'm cancelling what I've got now. Yeah. Am yeah. I going to get it automatically when I go? Yeah. And that's really, that's really That's another thing area. that's come up in the RC is, is they're butchering uh, super funds for having default insurance. I'm yeah. going, oh, come on, you know. Which, which is odd because bear is. in mind that was brought in with my super. Yeah. So it's a regulatory change that was brought yeah. in by the government it's, where it was where insurance for every age group was an opt-out. Yeah, I, I mean, for good reason. No, uh, uh, insurance is the one thing you just hope you buy and never claim. You know, there's no point saying, oh, if you never had insurance, you would have saved twenty or $30,000 for yeah. your life. It, or, okay, but imagine if something had yeah. gone wrong. <clears throat> but what, what, what will happen if, if it goes through in the in the, the fashion it's put forward now is that insurance premiums for everyone else is going to go up twenty percent because the the group under twenty five subsidise mm. through the premiums yeah. older age groups. So but surely take, take that's them out. not right though. No, that, that's that's like not. I should a... just charge less for those people. If you can't have you can't have one group propping up another group. But it's it's the pooling arrangement of insurance. That's how insurance works. works. Yeah, but it's yeah, but it should be cheaper. Um, to to the point that it should be balanced, right? Surely, yeah. Because otherwise, it's not fair. The, like if you go, if you're going, well, you're I know paying, this might freak you out. But younger people are generally healthier. Yes. Yeah, but they should be charged less. You can't say like, they are. They are. Yeah, but it, then how are they prop? How are they propping it up? Because if you're saying like, as uh, because well, there's such a small chance of uh, okay. So what you're saying is, I, I get the point. You're going into financial planner mode. Basically, don't you're you're saying don't get insurance now if you're under 25 because you're getting ripped. No, 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 no. Yeah, I'm, not, you I'm not saying that. No, no, I wasn't aware. I wasn't aware that, that 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 that's the case. But I feel like if that is a problem, then it means that the young people are getting ripped off because no. it should be that you're no. paying out X dollars, uh, X percent. Per dollar of premiums claimed, I, like I think that's how. Well, the, the, I thought that's how insurance works, right? They figure out how likely are you to claim. We need to charge this. This is our margin, so therefore that's I just the think, cost I of think, the cover. I think people over sort of forty would end up just getting charged so much it would become yeah. unreasonable. The, and, the, and the not charge if they got level premiums from private wealth when they were thirty-two, Clayton. <laughs> oh, please, <laughs> that's what I mean. People need to be educated, thinking about this stuff now, so that they can set themselves up in the right way. But. Yeah. It's yeah level I, level it, premiums. They talking, need to stick that in front of a royal commission. You're talking about like, um, you know, group group insurance arrangements, but we've already got non group insurance arrangements. So you know, premiums. I think, are, especially with the massive hikes in the industry funds, are, are, they're becoming very comparable. In some cases, like I would say, almost cheaper with the, some of the guys that that I look at. Really good retail contracts in comparison to some of the. The more expensive industry funds for those ones, they're yeah, they're, they're very comparable. But so you can't say that old people are going to get charged heaps more if if retail insurers are already offering individual contracts at competitive rates. Do you know what I mean? Uh, correct, but, but but within the insurance company, they're still pooling the risk. Yeah. So the the, the logic is that that you, the premium for a twenty five year old is obviously much less than a 50, 55 year old, but the likelihood of a claim of a fifty five year old is much much greater. Yeah. So that's the logic. So you, 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 your premium might be higher, but your payout's a lot higher. So level premiums all the way is what you're saying. Good. I'm on the right track then. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's turned into a contentious issue, Issue uh, level premiums. Yeah? Yeah, well, just because uh, indus- across the industry. Let's face it, it's, 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 um, it's mental illness. It's the mental stress, right, that people are claiming for everything. You know, oh, my job stresses me out there for I can never work again and I'm getting all this money. And then everyone else's premiums, even on level, have gone up 10%, 15% in a year kind of thing. Yeah, but 10 or 15% is not 100%. 
This is what I tell my client. I had a guy yeah, yeah. I did an point. SOA good meeting point. this morning and I said, look, I said, in the next three years, the insurance company, they, they did all level premiums. I said, the insurance company are going to put your premiums up. I said, they did it a little while back. It was 5% for lump sum. It was 10% for, um, for, for income replacement. Expect that that will happen, but it's never going to go from, you know, f- they, they were paying – you know, $60, $60 a month for a $200,000 life and trauma contract. That would have been $40 if they got on a step premium, maybe 30 ish But then, you know, five years from now, that's $100. Five years after that, it's $200. Like, sure. um, you know, they're still going to be way, way, way better off. So, yeah, like the insurance companies, one, they're losing money from, from a lot of these mental health claims, but yeah. two, they're insurance companies. So, like... I'd like to, I'd like to see a, uh, a limit on... Um on mental health claims. I'd like to see, a, a, you know, five years or something. Like, he's, you know, how long can you be stressed for? I don't know. I'm helping uh, someone with a with TPD, actually just got paid a TPD claim at the moment, three quarters of a million bucks. For a stress? Stress, mental breakdown. Whoa. Wow. Yeah, but wow. he's actually, it's weird because he got the claim and he, uh, I didn't actually know that that, uh, that he was going through the processes of like a family friend and uh, he got the, he got a mate, our mate had something with Slater and Gordon and got them involved and clearly they, they did a, they did a good job and uh, and they got the, they got the claim up for him, charge a pretty penny for their services, mm. uh, but he was yeah. quite happy because it was money that he probably wouldn't have got or, or mm. done all the things himself because he was he was very stressed out of it at, at the time um but he's now he's got the money and he's he's not con- so stressed anymore is he <laughs> probably go back to work next week <laughs> well he can go back to work that's the thing because he because i yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, can, can go back to yeah. can they said that you can have the money you can retrain yourself to to go and do a different to yeah. do a different job um so yeah it's an interesting it's yeah, very interesting just, well, it, just Aside the front, there's some insurers are looking at that at the moment and saying, well, rather than paying out a lump sum TPD, is they'll pay it out over say a five year period, but based upon qualifications. Yeah, sort of thing. So I was right. a bit confused about that though because it was. Then you get people walking around with the equivalent of that, you know, the, yeah. the sponge around the neck. <laughs> the equi- you know, they will walk around with like a propeller hat or something. Like, oh, I'm stressed. <laughs> Still stressed. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, yes. it's um. Uh, yeah, I thought it was a funny one because the claim was, uh, it was a group contract in uh in a in a super it was with AMP, and I thought that that was all any any occupation, but they were basically saying you could take the money, retrain yourself, and do an do another occupation. Maybe they did, they didn't have that clause or any yeah. occupation that you could reasonably well, be expected absolutely. to Absolutely, look, as soon as you again. receive insurance, they can't stop you from living your life yeah. again. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But, um, mate, I believe you've got a flight to catch. I do. I do. So uh, thank you Melbourne. very much for uh, coming in and sharing your words of wisdom, mate. You've got a really cool insight. If if, if anyone wanted to reach out to, with, to you, are you on LinkedIn or Twitter? Are you on, on LinkedIn, those? yes. Yep. Yes, yes. Very cool. In, in amongst one of the plethora of your companies, I'm sure they can <laughs> track you down. Yeah. Yeah. But I really appreciate your time here, mate. No thank worries. you very much. Absolute pleasure. Thanks, Thanks Cheers. Bye. Thank you.